Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Lawrence Cohn, the director of the Institute, and it's an honor to welcome Dr. Bernard Babe to the Institute of South Asian Studies to deliver a lecture entitled Swadeshi Bharati, Tamil Oratory and the Poetics of Political Modernity in South India. Uh, we're grateful to the uh, Chair of Tamil Studies uh, for supporting this event, uh, and as ever to the diverse Tamil communities of the Bay Area for supporting the Chair and programs of Berkeley. Professor Bade is Head of Studies in Anthropology at Yale NUS College in Singapore. He is in fact one of the college's inaugural faculty at NUS and has had the rare opportunity to create a college from the ground up. He was earlier a professor at Yale University, New Haven branch, at Columbia University, is taught, at uh, University of Michigan, and he did his PhD from the University of Chicago. Um, Dr. Bade is an exceptional scholar, and it is my job to say this about all the interesting intellectuals that pass through this room. In Dr. Bade's case, I mean this in a particular and emphatic way. Um, his path-breaking book, Tamil Oratory and the Dravidian Aesthetic, Democratic Practice in South India, examines how Tamil, and particularly the Tamil Democratic Political Oratory, comes in the second half of the 20th century, as he puts it, to be old. That is, to reflect a particular linguistic ideology of what Tamil is and Tamils are. To make and develop an argument for the modern classicism of political language, Dr. Bay has worked with immense care through a wide and deep range of historical sources, grounds his argument in an emergent historiography of Tamil modernity that he has done much to fashion, and engages the dynamic field of anthropological linguistics with power and for that field a clarity and generosity. Generosity is a particularly apt virtue to speak of in relation to Barney. He is not only a scholar's scholar, but by all accounts a great teacher, and is responsible for building and sustaining intellectual community globally, and has in fact been for years. His work includes several edited journal issues and numerous essays. I will mention three significant ones, Oratory Rhetoric Politics in the Cambridge Handbook of Linguistic Anthropology, The Ethics of Textuality, The Protestant Sermon in the Tamil Public Sphere, in the edited volume, Genealogies of Virtue, Ethical Practice in South Asia, and Political Praise in Tamil Newspapers, The Poetry and Iconography of Democratic Power in the book, Everyday Life in South Asia. Please, uh, he's currently a um, visiting scholar at Stanford in the Center for Humanities. Uh, please join me. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for that very kind introduction. Thank you to the Center and to the Institute for inviting me. Um, I've been in touch with me a lot, and I really appreciate the care with which you folks have have um, have taken in welcoming me here. Um, and thank you all very much for coming. Um, this presentation deals with C. Subramania Bharati, uh, his songs, his oratory, and it and it takes a few pieces of a book I'm trying to finish this year um, on the emergence of modern uh, uh, oratory as the central communicative modality of Tamil politics. My first work was dealing with an elocutionary revolution that occurred around the middle of the 20th century and corresponded with the rise of Dravidian politics. And despite the fact, what I, one of the things, among others, that I found in that work was that despite the fact that modern contemporary Dravidianist uh, oratory sounds very old because they upshift and sound literary and so on. In fact, it's a very new genre. Um, uh, uh, and despite the centrality of oratory in Tamil politics there, then, there must be some kind of genealogy of this new communicative form. And that I, I was able to find, you know, most people would say, when does Tamil oratory begin? begins with a guy named Adam Hanawalar, they say. And Adam Hanawalar was a man who lived in the middle part of, of the 19th century in Jaffna, um, uh, then Ceylon, and basically borrowed the Protestant sermon and, trans and used it for Saivite prasangam, or Saivite uh, sermons. You can even go to a place in Jaffna, in the Varnad Sivan Koyal, outside of the town of Jaffna, and there is a and in the high walls there, there is a kalmerte, a an inscription that says, "In this place, Adam Hanawa first delivered a Saiva Prasangam on December 31st, 1847." 
That's a remarkable thing to say. I mean, an inaugural event of a new kind of oratorical practice. And people noticed at the time and were quite freaked out by it and quite uh, on the Christian side and quite elated by it and inspired by it on the Syrite side. Um, and I'm basically looking at that moment when, when folks began to take up a particular model of discursive interaction and begin to universalize it to transform form first their own religions and literary f forms of discourse, and finally, in the beginning of the 20th century, politics and create. And I think that there is something we said that we can, we can track the development of Tamil oratory itself in the political realm with the formation of modern politics itself. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. I'm focusing on this guy. Um, and the paper I'm delivering to you today is, and the reason that the titles have shifted around a bit is because the paper is both new and old. I've been writing about Bhattavi for a few years and studying him on and off all of my life. But this presentation represents a reformulation of my ideas about him and his place in the modern political. He's become more and more central to the story that I'm trying to tell. He's kind of like a fulcrum. He's a shift, he's a, he's a place where things really shift in a dramatic way. And so therefore you can see what was before and that what is coming um, in his own time. His own, his work in his, his poetry and his life in my work has kind of metastasized in a good way. That is, he's shot through the entire book and the entire argument. And so today's uh, 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 presentation is taking a little bit from the beginning and then a lot from the central chapter of the central section of the book. It's difficult to overstate just how important he is in the Tamil world. Um, just, just as a matter of curiosity, how many people here have not heard of Subramanya Bharati? That's good, that's good. I'm, I'm glad there are a few that have not. I'm really glad that there's so many that have. A lot of audiences in South Asia studies, a lot of people don't know who Subramanya Bharati is. Imagine, right? It's kind of, it's kind of, um, it's kind of amazing. Um, not that one is, not that there's some lack there, but it's just, he's so ubiquitous to us. We breathe him from the moment we begin to speak Tamil. All of us, Tamils and folks who came to it later in life. Um, children compete in poetry and essay competitions on themes taken from his poem. He is considered the greatest Tamil, modern Tamil poet of the 20th century and nationalist poet of the Tamil people. He was also, something that even those who know about Bhadavi, Bhadavi's music don't know, is that he was also among the first generation of vernacular nationalist orators in what has been called the first modern political mobilization in India, the Swadeshi movement from 1905 to 1908. Bharati was a poetic engine of the, of the modern Tamil world insofar as he sung the hearts of people through his poesy and through his oratory. He interpolated them as a new kind of agency in the world, that is the people themselves. And through both the metapragmatics of a new model of discursive interaction in the vernacular public meeting and the palpability of his poesy, Bharati linked a large-scale modern social imaginary of a unified Tamil people stretching back in time to a vivid past and forward to a future of independence and freedom, freedom, a socio-chronotopic imagination characteristic of the modern nation state. So this paper, this presentation, forefronts the importance of the poetics and the ritual action in which both of these nationalist songs were sung and the oratory that accompanied them. That is public meetings and the processions during the Swadeshi movement. For the context of the ritual animation of these songs and speeches was very much a part of their meaningfulness. This, the place of the poetic, the, and the, and the other thing is I'm trying to get at here is the place of the poetic and the musical within the politics of the Swadeshi movement in Bharati's poetry and music as well as in the wider nationalist movement itself. The, pa the paper is, in the end, an attempt to disambiguate some of the strands of his modernity, to frame his modernity in his own singular voice. He is an uncanny figure. He's very familiar to us. He's an icon of the modern Tamil nationalism and piety, pi and piety, but he's also very strange. The longer I look at him, the stranger he becomes. Let me 
me cut to the chase and offer a piece of Bharati's verbal art that demonstrates that uncanniness. In this case, one of his latter nationalist songs, Long Live Indian Society, or Bharata Samadayam. And then and if I had a little handout, I think everybody's got it. I'm just going to give you one minute or so of this, just to give you a flavor of the sound of it. I think this was in the, um, this, this, this is in the ragam of, of Bharati's uh, original specification, and it was done in 1961. <laughs> This is awesome. We might just want to watch the whole thing because it's so damn awesome. <laughs> watch the figure in the back, by the way, Bhadak Mada at first and watch him change. cycles through a series of refrains and secondary refrains and verses, and as such the song continuously turns back on itself as it moves forward in time. Or as the Vesh Soneji put it, the song oscillates between the past and the present. Such oscillation laminates the time of the narration upon the narrating time, the stories upon the telling of the stories. 
producing a peculiar imagination of time that has been called piazza. Such an experience of history would have been appropriate within ritual contexts, such as those massive public meetings on the broad sands of the marina in Madras, where they were first sung in the high passions and new spirit of the Swadeshi movement. Here, bodily worships Indian society, Samudayam, as a deity, an entity that can encompass the entirety of India itself. Like a king, she is bountiful and provides for all the people. She is rich and fertile, giving and ample. She is a deity, a mother, as he wrote in some of his other days he had given her. Um, we can find analogs of this kind of theme for over a thousand years in the worship of Shiva, of Vishnu, and of kings who, like gods, made water flow over the land and thus make it fertile and green. The musical form is relatively newer, an innovation of 18th century Tanjavur, uh, taken from North India, we think. But one might imagine that the song speaks of, of ancient themes in what had, by 1907, become a classical genre. Though familiar, this song is also strange. In the very title of the piece, Bhadavi evokes the concept of samudayam, a society. Not a specific society of known individuals, but one that's made up of some 300 million people, Mupadakori Janandar. Imagine that if you can. Since when did such numbers attach themselves to populations, especially such vastly imagined populations as 300 million? Modern censuses had been conducted by the colonial officials in India beginning with some enthusiasm in the 1820s, exactly the same time that Europe experienced an avalanche of printed numbers regarding the new art of statecraft called statistics. But besides statisticians and those who might one day read their reports, why should a poet in the first decades of the 20th century sing of a population imagined numerically to a crowd gathered on the marina beach in Madras or published to be read and sung widely? And I'd like to ask this audience if they can think of, in the various different languages they know, of the first of the oldest instance of somebody using those kinds of big numbers to imagine society in a poem. Yeah. In India, I think, it's, I, the earliest one we get is Vande Madara in 1882. These 300 million people form an association. It's another uncanny thing. A sangha, of course. You know, uh, a, a term that often evokes the ancient lineage in Tamil, the academies or associations of scholars dating back to the first centuries of the common era. But such sanghams were scholars and poets, grammarians, people whose names we, or at least those who study such things, know. They were sanghams, we might imagine, in which every member knew or knew of every other member. Weirdly, Bada these things of a sangam of millions of ordinary unnamed people, an abstract sangam corresponding to an abstract society. Likewise, the members of that sangam, each unnamed and unknown individual, will have rights. Podu Uraimai, and my teacher informed me that I misspelled it. It is Uraimai, not Uraimai. Um, the term Podu Uraimai means general, unrestricted, undemarcated, or common rights. He means, there, he means here something akin to human rights, a term we know he used in 1908, as we shall see a bit later. For this is a place where if only one person were to go hungry, were to be treated unjustly, then the world itself would be destroyed. No, where we the people, all 300 million of us, would rise up and destroy it. Here in this vast abstract social order, each person is mysterious related to each other person where we are a part of one family, one lineage, one Indian people, or one India Makar, where each one is sovereign over himself, all are kings, and bears the same relationship to the larger abstract social order, the Samadayam, the association, the Sangam, and the people, the Makar, as any other. So this vast association, one that could never physically instantiate itself in any one place, an association that, would, that, that can only, not to say merely be imagined, and yet one in which each person holds rights equal to all other, has the same standing as any other, where all are related in some strange way to each other, and where the suffering of one is equivalent to the destruction of the whole society. What Bhadavi sings here is a modern social imagination. And truly, as Bhadavi stresses in no uncertain times, India, like this poem, is both a wonder and a newness. The presence of Krishna, of course, implicates that newness with something old. From the incarnation of Krishna in this song, and his citation of one of the key lines from the Bhagavad Gita, as he articulates this pudamai, this newness, suggests that the ideas he articulates here are actually quite old. Hmm. 
Now, this is not to say that, sung, that singing Paramahansa to Krishna, a universal being, is strange. Indeed, we will later find ourselves grappling with the uh, ubiquity of Krishna in the imaginings of modern political men throughout the land. Think Tilak and Aurobindo, um, and the list goes on. What is strange, uncanny even, is that Krishna becomes an avadharam of India itself, representing the principle of unity that exists within all human beings. I live within all lives, and teaching the world that all human beings are one. All are one. Such universal values have been articulated before in, our, in the thought. Here's an ancient line, uh, recognizable to everyone in the Tamil-speaking worlds today. We take this lovely phrase today to be a commonplace of modern political and civic belonging. belonging. But this is the vision of a renunciate, someone who has given up the ties to home, family, wife, the world, and the householder. His rootlessness gives him and only him the freedom of his impartial universality. There is a kind of particularity in this universal love. And Krishna himself, the Avadharam of Vishnu in the Bhagavad Gita, represents a monism of soul, as it were, a kind of metaphysical underpinning of all reality. It's a beautiful idea, and it's quite ancient. But it is far from the social order that most people lived within, far from the massively hierarchical complexes of caste, lineage, and status that has characterized Indian society for millennia. It is, in other words, far from the social imaginary that is articulated in this song, a modern social imaginary of an abstract social order, 300 million theoretically equal human beings, a modern social imaginary that's infused with the idea of Krishna. The song then, penned, we think, in his final years, printed a year after his death in 1921, and sung in political meetings throughout the mass political movement for Indian independence and beyond, offers a glimpse into Bharati's uncanny sense of things. It's, fear, it's clearly familiar to political moderns, those who imagine large-scale abstract social orders in which all individuals are theoretically the same. It's also strange. For the songs index a very peculiar social milieu and activity for the political modern, for instance, singing praises to God as a part of politics. And the image of God in society, both as a charioteer or philosopher offering counsel to a warrior, or a cowherd playing a flute, or a mischievous baby stealing butter, or a young man sitting in a tree teasing girls, or a lover who seems always to break his word to meet us where and when he promised. Bharati's Krishna Samudayam represents a crystalline, crystalline form of the object I'm seeking to uncover in this, in this work, a peculiarly modern image of social and political order, the abstract society and the equally abstract individual in the form of a being who can utter an instantly familiar phrase from Indian thought and literature as an element of the modern social, of the modern political. That this image was uttered in a poem by Tamil's premier modern poet, that it was sung in meetings embodying the modern mass political is also central to the story, as Subramanya Bharati himself is. By virtue of his songs, his oratory, his writing as a journalist, and his unprecedented political action, Bharati stands as an archetype of the Tamil political modern and sets out a framework for its unfolding in the 20th century. In a word, he modeled the vernacular politician, the orator to the masses, the central figure of the ritual of the mass meeting that modeled a vision, that modeled itself in the little, as a little ritual crystal and diagram of the larger social world in which what everybody is imagining. Now, um, in the remainder of this paper, I'm going to interrogate the relationship between the poetry of Bhadavi um, uh, 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 and his speeches and the emergence of this mass political. I'm, focusing, I'm going to focus on just two events for today, separated by a little over a decade. A set of speeches Bhadavi and his compatriots gave, um, and two of his songs. The first event involved a procession, um, music, and a large public meeting on the Marina Beach in Madras on 9 March 1908. It was just during this time that Bharati wrote some of his most famous nationalist songs in a simple Tamil set to folk meters and melodies perfect for interpolating the new political agency of the Tamil people. The second event involved a sighting of Bharati 11 years later at a crossroads not far from the marina during a procession of fervent political actors moving towards the first great Satyagraha of the Madras presidency on 6 April 1919. By that time, Bharati had been all, all but broken of politics through exile and poverty, official repression, and opium. And yet the enigmatic poet was cited dancing in and out of events associated with the political form that he had helped to establish. 
On 6 April, a prominent reporter and activist documented a wondrous encounter with Bharati in which the poet sang a song and danced and merged with God in the process. That this performance may have been imagined, perhaps even dreamed, makes no difference to the importance of Bharati's role in the formation of the Tamil modern. He was a profoundly precocious child and was given the honorific Bharati um, uh, uh, by a council of learned men under the Raja of Yathyapuram in 1897 upon the occasion of his marriage at the age of 15. Bharati came to political consciousness as a young nationalist at the outside of, outset of the Swadeshi movement, a period described at the time as the new spirit in India. It was, the movement was born of a conjuncture of the 1905 partition of Bengal and the emergence of a division within the Indian National Congress between two groups, the moderates, who called for continued cooperation and civil political engagement with the British authorities, and the nationalists, sometimes called the extremists, but they themselves called themselves the Pudukachi, or the new party, um, adopted, uh, advocated a much more confrontational stance towards the Raj and an accelerated path towards self-rule, Swaraj. Many of the key diacritics of the Indian independence movement were born during this short-lived mo movement, including economic Swadeshism, which involved the boycott of foreign goods, and the promotion of Indian-made goods, in particular clothing. National education or, or schools and colleges run not by the government, but by Indians. And per that's, that's okay. <laughs> and perhaps the most profound invention of this period was the use of vernacular languages and the eschewal of foreign one, ones in political meetings. For nearly the first time, it's an interesting claim and, and debatable, and we can do so afterward, but for nearly the first time, especially in the Madras presidency, political leaders systematically addressed non-elite audiences in vernacular or Swadeshi languages, consciously interpolating a new Indian public. Economic and educational Swadeshism, in other words, would be paralleled by a linguistic site Swadeshism. When G. Subramanya Ayer, the founding member of the Indian National, a founding member of the Indian National Congress and founder of the Hindu and the Tamil daily Swadesha Mitran, began to speak in Tamil during one of the meetings in 1907, he was interrupted by the audience, imploring him to speak English because he was known as one of India's most brilliant English orators, and therefore one of the most brilliant orators in the world. He rep in, uh, a sub-inspector of police uh, filed a report in which he replied with the following admonition. Gentlemen, the subject which I am going to deal with is Swadeshi and Swaraj. As the subject relates to these, it will not be consistent with our principles to lecture in a foreign tongue, since most of the audience are not conversant with English, and all of you know Tamil. I request you all to listen to it carefully at least from the point of view of the leaders, if not from the point of view of the common folk, there was a clear linkage between linguistic and political modernity. Now for a little over a year in 1907 and 8, there was a vast expansion of meetings and processions, and the new spirit of India was in full efflorescence in Madras. Bodily and a small group of young men formed several organizations, most prominently the Chennai Janasangam, uh, or the Madras People's Society, as an expression of the nationalist Cause, as well as a counterweight to the venerable Madras Mahajana Sabha. Bharati's speeches, at least, were accompanied by nationalist songs and poems, many of which would become standard in the coming decades. Now, the processions and meetings of 9 March 1908 were held to celebrate the release from jail of Bipin Chandra Pal, a leading Bengali Swadeshi activist whose speeches just the year before gave impetus to the expansion of the Swadeshi movement in Madras. Police reported that about 8,000 people attended, a crowd made larger, claimed the act, acting secretary of government, due to a football match by Madras pre presidency college students, uh, by presidency college students on the beach that day. There were multiple pr processions, at least one with music, from all over the city to the foreshore of the South Beach, just opposite the presidency college. The sub sub inspector who made the translation transcription of the speeches noted that Bharati quote spoke in Tamil unquote, and he writes. Let's see. No, I'll get there in a second. A public meeting was held on the foreshore of the South Beach Triplicane on the evening of 9 March 1908 in connection with the release of Vivin Chandra Pal. One of the speakers, Subramani Abadadi, spoke in Tamil as follows. When will this thirst for freedom be quenched? When will these fetters of ignorance be removed? O Lord that caused the great war of Mahabharata, 
Are plague and famine intended only for your devoted? Are strangers to prosper while we suffer? O Lord of the universe and protector of the good, is it not your principle to shield the innocent and the suffering? Have you forgotten about the patient suffering? He further said, Gentlemen, you have daily seen and heard of people being sent to jail and released therefrom, but you never troubled yourself about them. But why have you all assembled here today? You've not come here for honoring a Maharaja or another one with grand titles, but it is to celebrate the release of Bipin Chandra Pal today. We have been drawn together here not on account of Pal's character, but we have met here on account of the faith we have in Swaraj, or on account of the love we have of our country. We are toiling for the welfare of our country. Paul had such views and experienced the troubles that arose from them. All of us too should suffer according to our might for our principles of Swaraj and love of our country. The police report noted that the speech was, quote, very vehement and was received with applause and approbation by the audience, unquote. Bharati then sang the song indicated above, what we now know as Yendra Taniyum in the Subandra Taham, a faithful song that would become standard fare during India's independence movement, and about which I'll speak a bit more in a moment. Bharati's speech and song were echoed by the venerable G. Subramani Ayer. GSA's speeches began with the long durée history of India, a land that was prosperous for thousands of years and had a civilization while, quote, other nations were barbarians and were living in forests, unquote. India's wealth and education were such that other nations traveled to India to learn of them and partake of its prosperity. But India's fortunes changed as, quote, everything under the sun has to experience the vicissitudes of time, unquote. Now, I think what happened was is that I sent that this is the earlier version of the, of the PowerPoint presentation. So you're going to have to bear with me a little bit as I read this out. Uh, my mistake, by the way, because I gave it the same title. So. <laughs> My bad. Whenever the country was reduced to such a state, uh, this is Subramanya there had appeared great men or Mahatmas who had risen above considerations of self and endured all sorts of troubles, reformed the country, and raised it to the level of prosperity. During the reign of the Hindu Rajas, many sages or Maharishis appeared and sacrificing their personal welfare, worked for the good of the country. Then followed Manu and Mantata, and others who ruled for the welfare of the people. Then came Ramachandra, an incarnation of God, who put down the Mlechas and removed all the difficulties from the way of the people. Before the Mohammedan conquest, Buddha reformed the, the country when it was in need of reform. It was followed by Sankaracharya, Ramanacharya, Madhuacharya, who by their religious discourse and preaching introduced order into that society. When the people were afflicted with Mohammedan oppression, Sivaji came to the front and overcame the Mohammedans and ruled the country as Hindu rajas of old." Unquote. He then acknowledged that India had come again to the point in time where it had been laid low, and he suggests that Bipin Chandra Pal is another Mahatma who has been appointed by God to be a new force to raise up the people of India. Moreover, he continued, the men who did good to the country till now were not high court judges or men with titles or those that drive a pair, but only those that had sacrificed the pleasures of the world and had suffered privations and troubles for the way of the people. Now both of these speeches model an appeal to faith, faith in the country and faith in Swaraj, that is faith in a generalizable principle of social and political reform. Bhadali also holds up Bhakti Chandra Paul as an exemplar of suffering as he was true to his faith. Paul had such views and experienced troubles that arose for them, he said. As a preacher extols his flock and follows the example of Christ, so too does Bhadali exhort his audience to follow the example of Paul. All of us too should suffer. We should all join and work for or fight for our principles of Swadeshi and Swaraj. Now at this point, um, and bear with me for just one moment, I mean this, this, this is uh, the, the, the association with a, a Protestant kind of way of think, talking about the world is, I think, pointed and worth paying attention to. The political modern here, it, you know, it involves a particular way of looking at society, holding it out at arm's length, being able to evaluate its problems and then acting upon it in certain predetermined ways. Not only that, each and every individual, not just the princes, not just the priests, have the responsibility to act in the same way. That is a very odd kind of idea 
Some political theorists, such as Michael Walzer, suggest that it was emerged for the first time in the world with the post-Calvinist saint. Arguable point, we can argue about it later. But just as Paul is placed in the position of a suffering God and an exemplar of social and spiritual action, so too is he cast in G. Subramania Iyer's speech as an incarnation of God. Only in this speech, that God is Vishnu, or to be more specific, the avatar of Vishnu who appears as a savior when mankind falls into dark times, like Krishna of the Bhagavad Gita, who asserted his own status as an avatar of Vishnu, born to protect the human right race from ignorance and as an uh, uh, from ignorance and evil. As Subramani Ayer takes it a step further by placing Paul as an avatar within a historical linear time frame that includes lawgivers, bhakti saints, Gautama Buddha, and the Marathi warrior Sivaji. Ayer concludes, when we consider Paul's actions of the last four or five years, it cannot but be said that he appears as though he was reincarnated and has inherited new force. So the speeches delivered in a public meeting in 1908 offer, like the poem offered at the beginning of this paper, an uncanny blend of modern universalisms, the first in the rhetorical and aesthetic sense of appealing to the soul, to the sacrifices of self on behalf of faith and a larger purpose, the abstract social order and the theoretical equivalence of all men, and the second as a well-structured oration that casts Hindu ethics and heterogeneous dense time into an ethic that remains constant over the long durée of homogeneous historical time, sometimes called modern time, what Partha Chatterjee calls the utopian time of nations. And of course, the speech is universalizable, or nearly so, given that it's universalizable to a, to a generalized audience, or nearly so, given the last few restrictions placed upon who might be in an evening audience composed of upper caste men on the beach. From the point of view of the speakers, these speeches were addressed to all Indians, even though Dalits, Muslims, and women would not necessarily be considered the members of the Swadeshi public by most of these elite activists, lower, lower class activists actually did. So no doubt the take, take up of the modern form of the sermon, complete with the themes universalizable to a generalized public, to a modern social imaginary, qualifies this event as one among so many around the globe which newly interpolated the people as a new kind of entity, a new collectivity made up of what Subhita Kaviraj called zero-degree individuals, those quintessentially modern beings free from the restricting bonds of social categories such as caste, at least in theory. But beyond a purely conceptual level, the music and poesy accompanied the procession, accompanying the procession and the song that Bharati sung that day offers a glimpse into what made these orations singular to this place and time. Here lay their power, a power to which the activists and the authorities were not insensitive. A high court, court uh, Vaikyo, Tirumalachari, uh, the secretary of Bharati's group, the Chennai Janasangam, had appear, appeared before the commissioner of police H.F. Wilkinson, a few days before the event, to request permission to process with fireworks and music. Wilkinson refused to grant them a license to do so, he wrote, quote, for obvious reasons, end quote. They processed with music despite the ban. Wilkinson was certain that these meetings represented a grave threat to the Raj. In a letter to the acting chief secretary of the governor of Madras, he wrote that the spirit of lawlessness exemplified on the ninth when speakers openly defied the law, was not merely a one-off event, but a far more, um, a far more ominous, quote, sign of the times, unquote. I think it would be a good thing, he wrote, if we could stop the local agitators speaking in public. Though what they say may not be very serious, still their words are understood by the ignorant mob as purely anti-British. Now, the open violation of the law that particularly outraged Wilkinson was the playing of music during the procession after he had expressly refused to give permission for it. The Sangam, Wilkinson quipped, is in no sense a musical society. Nevertheless, and in violation of his refusal, some members of the procession did have music. Quote from the police report. On 9 March 1908, all the procession started from different parts of the city and proceeded towards the South Beach, where a public meeting was convened. The processions were orderly till they reached the Victoria Hostel where music was commenced and used until they reached the South Beach. No, it was orderly until music commenced. Could lead to dancing. 
After the yeah, continuing with the police report, after the procession met on the foreshore of the South Beach, two of the speakers named Subramania Bharati and Ethiarad Surendranath Arya, an awesome guy I don't have time to talk about today, in the course of their speeches said that in defiance of the commissioner's orders, they used music and that the audience should take an oath that they must be, be within the legal bounds of law as far as it did not interfere with their natural rights, but when it did so, they must infringe the same and break them. Despite Wilkinson's alarm and calls for prosecution, officers at Fort St. George were unable to bring Bodhi or Arya to book as they didn't yet have the legal tools to prosecute these speeches. The form of the speech was simply so new that laws had not yet been written to deal with them. Neither did they have surveillance procedures or recording technologies, like for instance, shorthand, um, that would enable them to prove charges of sedition under existing laws, laws devised to monitor, record, and prosecute prosecute printed instances of sedition. It's worth paying attention to the fact that Bada and Arya vehemently objected to being denied permission to play and sing music in procession. A common theme in both their speeches that day was the insistence that a ban on singing constituted violations of their natural rights. The deployment of the Enlightenment concept of national rights, as in so many of these other uncanny uh, elements of, of, of Bada's practice, masks something singular to their attachment to the music for it was in the music and poetry of the event that the Tamil modern inhered. The song Bharati Sang, it turns out, became a famous one. Though first published just a few days before, Bharati, days before in Bharati's paper, The India, it was sung for decades during the freedom struggle in public meetings from at least the late 1920s. I interviewed an old man a couple of years ago who remembered being in Madurai in the late 20s and singing that song. I do have a nice copy of it. Um, we know it is Yendra Taniyum in the Sudan When will our thirst for freedom be quenched? When will our love for slavery die out? When will the chains on our mother's wrists be broken? When will our afflictions end? O Lord of the Mahabharata, O protector of Aryas, is it not by you alone that we are victorious? Is it meet that your true devotee should languish without your aid? Now, of the many, many things, I'll let it be there, of the many, many things I could say about this song, I'm going to mention just two elements the raga and the discursive form in which the song might be sung. To put it uh, simplicity, especially after um, David Shulman's talk today, ragas are something like, oh my gosh are something like keys in Western music and have associated with them, at least theoretically, specific sets of emotions or feelings, rasa. Bharati specified that the song was sung in kamas, a raga sometimes described as tuneful or, folk or folksy. Many of the nationalist songs that Bharati composed were set to familiar tunes often expressly considered folksy or naktapura mekti, at least from the point of view of the 20th century musical specialists, such as his granddaughter Lalita Bharati. Kamas, kamas is often the, the, the raga of shorter, lighter tunes, which conclude concerts on an upbeat or happy note. The rasa, or feeling associated with this raga, sringara, or the erotic, which gives it a somewhat playful feeling. Now, eroticism, longing, and even play between lovers is certainly appropriate in a song for Krishna. But why would such a song be an appropriate accompaniment for a speech on Swadesh? And this is the second thing to be said about this piece, its discursive form. Bodily was borrowing from another new form in the early 20th century Madras, the bhajan. Not that bhajans are new, but they were new in Madras at that time as a, as a new kind of popular activity. They are home, temple, or even street-based worship sessions involving singing or devotional, uh, 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 singing devotional or bhakti songs to their deities. A, particular pop a particularly popular set of bhajans at the turn of the 20th century Madras were those sung to the beautiful Lord Krishna and his consort Radha set amid scenes of the old stories, the Puranas. Among the most common of these scenes is Krishna's teasing and forsaking of the gopis, the cow-herding young women who pine for his love. Though in practice bhajans were restricted to, to Brahmins, at least ideologically they cut across caste, sect, and lineage divisions among high caste organizations. Again, ideally, their practitioners saw themselves as engaging in universalizing discourse, like the public meetings themselves, 
that were probably a great deal more restricted, restricted than the ideology held. A major theme in the bhajans, especially those involving Krishna, was the theme of erotic longing by Radha, or more commonly by the gopis, the cowgirls, who longed for his embrace. Men singing these songs cast themselves in the role of the gopis, each hoping to be Krishna's lover. In one song taken from the Bhagavata Purana, Krishna grants each of them their heart's desire and dances with all of them simultaneously. But Krishna is mercurial, fickle, difficult to pin down. He often fails to do what he says, to show up for the secret meetings arranged with his lover. And in the coming years, during his exile in, ba in Pondicherry, Bharati comp actually composed a cycle of songs about how Karnan, as both male and female lover, Karnan and Karnama, fails to meet for agreed upon trysts. The same feeling of longing is now cast in a nationalist idiom. An idiom clearly understood and taken up by nationalists all over the course of the freedom movement and into post-colonial democratic politics. And like so many powerfully powerful poetic images, this one too is polysemous, refracting several possible senses at once. On the one hand, Krishna is a mercurial god who may or may not grant our boons and fulfill our longings. At the same time, while Bhadavi plays the role of gopi, of pining girl waiting for his fickle lover, Krishna is also cast as the people who could, if only they willed it so, shake off the shackles of British rule in a day. Indeed, such a call uh, to action by 300 million people was a part of most of the speeches for which we have records during this day on 9 March throughout the presidency. It was a democratic movement but of the long to lead if only they would rise up and exert the power they had in their hands. And as it turned out, Krishna would fail him. On the day Bhadavi sang this song, events elsewhere in the Madras presidency provoked a crackdown that would bring the Swadeshi movement to an end. In particular, this was the, uh, um, uh, 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 Bhadavi's friend and colleague in the Chennai Janasangam, Bao Chidambaram Pule, along with his charismatic companion, Subramania Shiva, violated a ban on holding a meeting to celebrate Paul's release in Tutukuri, and they were arrested a few days later. Um, their arrest sparked an uprising, a police firing that resulted in four deaths and several dozen wounded, and the burning and gutting of the district magistrate's office. Over the next few months, young leaders of the Swadeshi movement across the land were rounded up and charged with sedition. The authorities even went so far as to arrest the venerable G. Subramania Ayer, a shocking turn of events which led to a general outcry among prominent citizens and his rather speedy release upon signing a document promising not to print seditious sentiments in his paper. A few of the younger men begged for leniency and forgiveness for their youthful transgressions. Um, uh, and in some cases, the charges were dismissed at the cost of the young men's humiliation. Others received the full brunt of British outrage. Vau, Chirampadam Pirle, and Subramania Siva were given life sentences of rigorous imprisonment, later reduced to six years, of which they served every day. Bhadavi was never charged with sedition as the authorities failed to move quickly enough against his violation on the ban of music. And that's what they were holding him. That's what they were holding over his head, was the fact that he sang. But fearing for his freedom, he fled to French-governed Pondicherry, where he would remain in bitter exile until 1919. And it was indeed bitter. Despite many letters written, to him, written by him to newspapers and to British officials, he was never certain he would not be arrested should he return to Madras. And though he continued for a few years to publish the India, Bhadavi's exile in Pondicherry ultimately broke him of politics. It broke him in many ways. Unable to engage in steady newspaper work, he and his family were reduced to poverty. They often went hungry. He also took to opium, which at least from his friend Vao Chis, Vao Chirapadam Perle's account, fundamentally transformed him. He continued to write brilliant poems, many beloved to this day, including the cycle of songs devoted to Krishna, such as the one I said above, but most of these would be bhakti party, devotional songs, not political. Political uses of bhakti, of course, have long been noted in the descriptions of the Indian political. 
And though he would not engage in formal politics when he finally returned to the Madras presidency in 1919, there were several reports of him showing up at various kinds of meetings at which he sang devotional songs. Two intelligence reports mentioning him at labor meetings, some of which would prove to be among, to be among the most influential in the development of the mass political in Tamil lands. For these were the meetings that expressly addressed the working man and woman, that called them to the political, to persuade them into speech and action, as one labor leader, the theosophist B.P. Vaudia, put it. These were the latter-day incarnations of those meetings convened by, convened by Vau Chirambaram Pillai and Subramaniya Shiva on the beach in Tutukuri uh, in 1908, or the Telugu Swadeshi meetings of working men and women addressed at Madras's Moor Market by Ethiraj Surendranath Arya. So while Bharati had an uncanny ability for showing up at what would become the most important political events of the day, his songs were strictly devotional, not pointedly political, like his earlier Swadesh Adhivindra. Weirdly, at least from the point of view of the, of, the, of the police, he appeared at political events as a non-political actor. One of the final reports of these strange apparitions comes, apparitions comes from from the famous memoir by newspaper man, editor of the nationalist paper, Desha Bhaktan, and labor activist, Tiruvi Kalyanasundra, or Tiruvi Ka. There he recounts a sighting of Bharati in a procession on the way to the single largest public meeting ever held in Madras on 6 April, 19, uh, on 6 April 1919. It was the first great satyagraha of the Madras presidency, a political meeting par excellence, a form that would become the very archetype of Indian political action throughout the independence movement and into post-colonial democratic politics, the essence of the Indian mass political. Reports by nationalists, opposition newspapers, and police all agreed some 100,000 people showed up that day. And the stages were set up on the very same spot, on the marina, across from the Presidency College, where Bhadali and his comrades gave speeches and sang their songs 11 years before. Bhadali didn't speak, of course but he did sing. Thiruvika describes how budget groups came singing and dancing their way to the beach, just as they had 11 years before to celebrate the release from jail of Bipin Chandra Pal. On this great day, however, the crowds were 10 to 12 times larger. Thiruvika joined in with a group that passed their newspaper office, and they made their way toward the beach, singing and dancing along with everyone else. In the afternoon after they passed the meeting place of a major devotional group in Rayapetta, a few blocks away from the beach, Thiruvika noticed that, quote, at some point or another, Subramaniya Bharati had joined the procession. Quote, as soon as he appeared, our ears were enslaved to his song. I asked Bharati to sing. The great Tamilian began to sing the song, Murga Murga. Now, let me break from this description to speak of this song. This is another hymn, a short song, a folksy raga called Naktakurindi. It is almost certainly composed as a budget, a simple tune with a simple idea that enables a group of non-specialists to embody the devotional mood in music and song. Again, the song is sung to the beautiful young god Murugan, the son of Shiva, a hunter and warrior, and like Krishna, a god of passion. Unlike Krishna, however, Murugan is not so unreliable. The first stanza of his tune, Murga, 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 I, I don't have time, I'll play it at the end, um, <coughs> you can hear it. You come riding on a peacock, with your bright spear you come, and you give us your goodness, worthiness, and praise. Your penance is your divinity, your quality, your renown. Murga, murga, murga. Now let's return to Tirubhika's description. The song, a Tamil song, a Murugan song sweeter than honey, stirred the Murugan in the picture to start moving. I think I do have a picture of this. Because I'm pretty sure this was, uh, the song, a Murugan song, sweeter than honey, stirred the Murugan in the picture to start moving. It appeared as though the form of the portrait came surging out. The devotees' bodies began to sweat and shake. Some fainted, some fell down. Everyone was enraptured in joy. And Bharatiyar became the figure in the painting. I saw with my eyes and my heart the true unity of the song and the image in the portrait. Then, after a little while, Bharatiyar took his leave and left us. Now, what are we to make of this description? Mm, mm. It's actually, the, the picture I'm pretty sure was, was a Ravi Varma of, uh, of Murugan. I'm pretty sure that was the one, but this is not happening. What are we to make of this description? 
Was it merely the collective effervescence of the moment? Here, the quintessential Tamil deity, Murugan, the son of Siva, seems to be awakened from his merely representational avatar in a framed print and merges with the poet who, more than anyone else, spoke the Tamil people into existence. Here, too, an image of the, of the deity to whom Tamils all over the world perform awesome, transinducing austerities in order to become the peacock vehicle of the god. From Jaffna to Singapore, they dance for hours on end with palaquin, palaquin festooned with peacock feathers upon their shoulders. Or they swing above a crowd from hooks piercing the muscles in their backs as their wives and children dance below them. The austerities of the Satyagrahis that day had been to sing and dance for miles along the streets in the midday sun near the height of the Tamil summer as Bharati danced the god. The dreamlike quality of this description is not merely an expression of the creative force of Thiruvika, though it certainly is that. The event occurred only a few months after Bharati was released from jail after his nearly 10-year exile in Pondicherry. Bharati had been residing in the southern Tamil Nadu in, southern Tamil Nadu in his wife's village, Kadayam, and was keeping a low profile. He was not engaging in active po politics, for he would never again engage in politics. His political contributions had already been written and would be sung for the remainder of the 20th century in his song celebrating India, Tamil Nadu, and freedom. And as for 6 April 1919, scholars of Bharati believe that Bharati was in Kadiyam that day and not in Madras. What does it mean, if anything, whether Bharati danced the god that day on, of the great Satyagraha or whether Tiruvika dreamed it? Now, there happen to be other accounts of Bharati showing up weirdly. There's one very famous one in which he's said to have confronted Gandhi a few months before this and said, well, you come to him, speak in a meeting tonight. And the guy said, no, no, I've got, I'm kind of busy tonight. Sorry, pal. He goes, well, you lose. And he sort of stormed out. He wasn't there. It didn't happen. But, people said, but a number of people have written. I've published reports from respectable presses that have said that that happened. Um, there's also a, a reports of a failed speech in, in Madras where he began, rather than he was invited to, to speak, but instead of speaking, he just started singing and had to be escorted from the stage by concerned uh, 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 chair of the meeting. It's clear that these kinds of austerities, passions, and poesy would be a part of the formation of the Tamil modern from the beginning of mass politics. Ranajit Guha argues in his essay on the Raulat Satyagraha that such shows of emotion in the political realm were elements of elite demonstration of their own legitimacy in the face of British rule. That may be true, but it is also the case that such enthusiasm cannot be reduced to the mere machination and intentions of elite political will, but was the modality in which the political, the modern mass political, would be danced, sung, and imagined, dreamed or not, to the Rikas account offers a truth about Bharati and Tamil political journey. Should I go on too long? No. And the um, floor is open for questions. Yes. Yes, folks, please. So, um, the two things that I was curious about. Um, he, he, at one point, um, I don't know when, writes about uh, the, the Russian Revolution. Oh, yeah. Who the others, yeah. Um, you see a lot in 19, um, he's writing a lot about 1905 in 1907. Okay. And then in 1919, he's writing about 1700. So, I mean, I'm wondering, you know, in Bharata Samadhi, for example, the Podu Vulamai, is that, is he making a reference of any sort? Because he's also talking about, you know, Elorum Motkulam and all of us are kings, is that? Absolutely, I would say he's, he's no, he is looking, and if you look at his newspaper, we have this fabulous multi-volume set of all of his writings uh, uh, by Sini Viswanathan, and we can read through everything we've got, and if, if Sini Viswanathan misses it, Vegara Chalapati has found it, and he's published this stuff too. So we've got a really good set of everything, with the exception of about 18 months in 1907 and eight, in which they were on the run, and we can't find these newspapers. We can only find police reports of them. We've got a really good sense of what he was writing in the Swadesh and in, in India, in Bala Bharati, etc. But he um, he was looking at Russia in a big way. He was looking at women's suffrage 
in a really big way. He was really key, key, keyed in, wrote a lot of essays on women's suffrage, you know, the Pankhurst sisters and all of that in London. Um, and he was writing about Japan. Uh, later on, he would write about Russia. And, and when he comes back to, to Madras uh, in the 90s, he's given a new sub editor job. That's why they submitted him. He's writing a lot about Russia, Greece, and Turkey. So he's looking at he's looking at this post World War One landscape of tr and post Russian Revolution landscape and and yeah absolutely I would say that he's all of these things that he's looking at are I think are um, refracting these notions of the modern political that the Swadeshi movement is intimately connected with Swadeshi though it articulates itself so so firmly in an Indian idiom is global and it's also I think um, it, it seems to be linked up to, um, to what's happening in Russia. Look at what's happening in 1906 in, in Iran, uh, the constitutional revolution, uh, uh, stuff going on, the new liberalisms that are emerging in China and in Japan. Um, it's pretty, pretty neat. It's, it's, it's very clearly, uh, like many Swadeshists, are looking around the world and finding uh, mirrors of themselves all over the place. Uh, well, it, it, it wasn't even in his life that he like, forcibly renounced his, uh, his Puna mm -hmm. um, and even thereby renouncing his, one could say, Brahminic identity, right? Do you think that was a consequence of his, his, his political agenda or has this been noticed in his poetry um, or was it just his uh, personal, like, bhakti kind of, like, should be I mean, there's a bunch of things. He, but he, there's, there's a lot of debate about him. I present a very positive view of Bada because I like him. <laughs> All right. There are people that critique him very. I mean, there's. I can't remember. There was one particular. I think it was um, Namakal Kavinya who wrote about uh, Bada the. Who was he speaking to? And they, he was talking to a Varlala, a Saiva Varlala, said, well, We should exchange children. But he's like, No, no, I'm not going to exchange children. I mean, I think he wore, a, he wore an odd dress for a Brahmin at that time. He wore a mustache. Yeah, yeah. He sat down, he did eat with other people, with non Brahmins. Um, but I don't know how far that went. There is evidence to suggest that you know, he maintained a pretty restrict. He was not hanging around with Dalits, for instance. He was not hanging around with Muslims, as far as we can see. Mm. He writes very, he writes very negatively, as Jesus Bhavanya Ayer did in that speech. He writes very negatively. Um, this is, as Johnny and I were talking about this earlier. I mean, a lot of folks have noticed that the Swadeshi movement really is the forerunner. It's not just setting out Indian nationalism, but it's setting out Hindutva. You know, in a way that you know these guys, they. they I'd like to think that Bhadavi, if he, if he saw, he was a real progressive. I mean, if he saw what was going on today, I'd like to think that he was not there. He would not be with the, with the new Hindutva. But they did set out that parallel. So his think. intention is still unclear. The, the very intention for removing. I think he's uncanny. I think you have to really see him as being not one ideological, you know, he's not coherent ideologically. He's sort of coherent unto himself. He's, you know, the more you see him, the stranger he becomes, the more subramanium he becomes. You know, and he's a really, really, really interesting and creative poet. I, I cut out a couple of stories here. There's some really funny ones. I'll tell you afterwards. They're really, really good ones. But he's just an amazing guy. Um, and but you know, he was inconsistent as, unlike me, he was perfect in every way. <laughs> Except for the argument. Yeah, <laughs> except for <laughs> any rate, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting question, and there's a lot of critique of it. Yeah. So I don't quite know where to start, because there's so many connections with, with the book that I'm writing here. But let me um, ask a couple of basic questions here. Um, you mentioned quickly that Bharti wrote nationalist poetry in many a genre. Yeah. But what you gave us in this talk today was almost, you gave us one, you gave us this wonderful one, which is hard sometimes. But then the other poems that you actually went through was the uh, Bhakti poems. Yeah, there were bhajans. Okay, there were bhajans. So just the, the contrast for me, listening to you, and I'm listening, I'm, I'm sort of contrasting this with his contemporary, Savarkar. Yeah. Ah. And uh, Savarkar wrote almost, I mean, he wrote 
he wrote Ovi, he wrote Arya, he wrote Fatka, he wrote Kavya, he wrote Kirtans, he wrote Bhajans, mm. he was all of them from the get go. Yeah. Um, are very much in a kind of same with the Ovi, he's very, very careful to make sure that the rhyming stays the way it should according to a classical tradition. Yeah. This I only just figured out like, yeah. two days ago. Um, but all of his poetry is just straightforwardly sort of political, national. Mm -hmm. um, so the question I was going to ask you is just sort of did Bharti do the same thing, or is he, you know, did he write across those genres? He wrote second across thing, genres and topics. Okay. So the second question you mentioned, I thought you had a very nice comment about the link between linguistic and political nationalism. Yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 linguistic Swadeshiism, you said. Yeah. So you said he gave a talk in 1907, did I have that right? Yes. Yeah. Now, 1907, you don't have um, megaphones you have? No. You don't. So no. the size of the crowd here, if is really strange. on a beach, yeah. is small, yeah. right? I mean, loudspeakers show up in India when? Well, late 20s? No, we don't get, we, I mean, we, the first public address system is by the Magnavox company right here in San Francisco, January 1st, 1915. That's the first time so we ever have it. In they don't start. They start showing up in some official discourse in the early twenties. The our our Namala, our great friend Venkatachalabadi, who knows all things, right. says <laughs> that yeah. he and he was he actually wrote me an email because he was in he was at the at doing his book on petty art and he was noting that you do not see systematic advertisement saying you know Mike set available until the early 1950s, early so, 1950s. So they were so there, so, but. Yeah. So the reason I'm asking you yeah. this is that 1937, Savakar gets out of house arrest. He yeah. gives this kind of giant address. Now, if I read the biographies of Savakar, yeah. they're going to tell me Chaupati is full. Yeah. Chaupati may have been full, I don't know, in 1937. But it's not clear everybody heard what Savakar said. Um, so the only thing that right. I wanted to sort of have you talk about is, yeah. you know, we were talking about this right. earlier, the use of this kind of, what should we say, non-classical idiom Shall we just make that the big broad well, I think that's for a large, po large popular mobilization? Absolutely. Um, I'm wondering whether a kind of nationalism has gone off and written about these these mobilizations is larger than they actually might have been. And I think yeah. you're right. Actually, so I think it is something I'm writing about in the sort of the big, the, 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 the first part of my talk about speaking Swadeshi uh, in, in, the, in the part of the book. I believe that everybody was overestimating the crowds. Yeah. First of all, um, everybody was, and everybody wanted to do so for different reasons. One, the authorities wanted to do so to raise the alarm. Yeah. The activists wanted to do so to show how big they were, right? But there was also a kind of, I think, they really saw bigger crowds than what were there. Mm -hmm. I think they really felt that there was something, and it's about this business of collective effervescence, and I take that very seriously. Yeah, yeah. This Durkheimian concept of, yep. you know, you get into big crowds and you feel the power of the crowd. He's got, at one point, Durkheim writes about the demon of oratorical inspiration, mm -hmm. that, had, that happens within these moments of collective eff effervescence, and you see this going on a lot. Uh, the, the third chapter of this is the first. I, the first iteration of it I gave right here at Berkeley in your conference three years ago was about what happened in Kutu Kutu. Mm -hmm. I mean, but like 35 days in which you just had like the brink of revolution just because some orator started dressing laborers. Mm -hmm. That was pretty awesome. But it was like they're talking about 5,000 people on the beach, and I don't believe it. I don't it's believe not it. The case talking about 30,000. But in in the 30s, sure, the major. The major Congress, uh, you know, uh, they would have. You can see pictures with Gan of Gandhi, yeah. you know, with, yeah. in front of, of, of big microphones. But those that was a those were well healed yeah. operations, yeah. right? These were not. These guys. These guys are, you know, they're bussing them, right? They're they're kids, really, who are doing this kind of stuff. They're not. They don't have resources at all. They're not a part of the established groups. I cut out a big chunk about of this paper about how these people were the opposite of the established groups in Madras at the time. And they fought with them. The moderates were like, oh, it's sort of like the Clinton side, you know. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna work this out, and you know, you Sanderites, we're gonna, we're gonna be fine, right? You know, it's like, it's like that. And the, you know, they bad. That was bad. So um, but, but no, no. And one more thing about, about this, and I, I really think that it's really interesting because, how big could some of these meetings really be? Um, I once, in reference to this, I wrote to David Graeber, our Occupy friend, right? 
And I said, David, could you tell me how big the biggest crowd is that you can actually talk to? And he actually put it out on his network and asked the question. And I said, when does the first, you know, when do these first big anarchist meetings, you know, without microphones, how big can they actually get? And he had a bunch of people writing in from South America and Greece saying, about 200 really is the biggest we can get and still have denotational coherence. Can I have one you know, last follow-up question? And, that, and, and I'll say, what, this in two seconds? Denotational coherence may not have been the most important part of it. One last question. Is, the, is this... The, you know, what you showed us about till then. Um, is that say, the story of Hayek's poem that is perhaps most widely known? No. The reason I ask this is, um, again, the, the foil, the mm. Savakar here. Mm. If I walked in and out, out and about in Maharashtra, at least if I walked around in, in Aurangabad, in Pune, in Mumbai, in places like that, with the Marathi middle class, and I mm. asked them mm. one of the poems that they know best, and they would all say, and so that well, becomes a peculiar, not a peculiar, but it became a kind of Marathi national, India national anthem sung in Maharashtra. So what we're talking today about how this, how it moves, right. what is the mobilizational power of it. I'm wondering, since you've been working on this, do you have any thoughts or could you say something about how how you would even get to the kind of circulation of this this material? Right? We we know that social commentary. We know that this was these were poems composed. We know they were set to music. We know they had some circulation. But just how did you get to the way in which they circulate? It's a long standing. It's and no a one's series of, a series of yeah. answers. The first of them is when I said no. Let me let me take that back for a second. One of the lines of this song are very very well known. As a matter of fact, it may have been the first thing somebody told me when I was a student on the Wisconsin program in 1981. Mm. You know, We will destroy the world if only one person does okay. That phrase is extremely famous. Mm. Um, you ask, ask the crowd here, what's the most famous of his nationalist poems? Yendra Taniyum in the Sudandara Thakam is a big one. but. There's a whole lot of them. I think Sentamal Nadar and the Bodhani lay in the Tain when the Pai of the Kathan would be probably the biggest. So for those non Tamils, could you translate? Sentamal Nadar, Yendra Bodhani lay in the Tain when the Pai of the Kathan lay. So uh, in the very word Sentamal Nadu, beautiful Tamil Nadu or fine Tamil Nadu, uh, what, what did I say? Sentamal Nadar and the Bodhani lay. In the Tain when the Pai of the Kathan lay. It's, it's like a sweet honey sending into your ear. Um, <laughs> Very nice. And that comes right out of Yeah, that's, you know, he's using. That is pr maybe one of his most famous, but there's a lot of famous. His current part of, his, the, there's a, he's really, really, really well known. No, no. And it's not just, he's, he's got this, he's got the, the nationalist tunes, what would, any, what would people say? What's his most famous nationalist tune today? I think it's Achamile, Achamile, Badilele. Or Vande Madhavam. Or Vande Madhavam. <laughs> But that's not his. Huh? What? That's not his. What's that? That's not his. Oh, he Bande Madhavam. No, he wrote several different Bande Madhavams uh, that were calcs on um, Bankim Chandra's Bande Madhavam, but they were, and some of them are really, really different. So he wrote several of them. Um, Achimili, Achimili. The Rindra became famous yeah. particularly because of the movie that came out. Uh, Couple of Tia Tamaras? Yeah, a couple yeah. of Should we just watch a whole bunch more? Those are really good. There's some really good ones in there. There's one that shows uh, cry and sob and Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I got too many questions. Okay, wait, 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 wait. wait. We can, there's another one other thing though I think that's worth noting and that we'll just throw out there is that there was uh, uh, Shivatambi wrote um, an essay on how Bodhi became Bodhi. And it was really in the late fifties. That that there's a big efflorescence and a re uh, a renaissance of Bada the Alia, you might say, <laughs> and <laughs> you know Bada the Alia, mm -hmm. and but and some one dear old friend now once 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 slammed me for that said no he wasn't he was a nobody back in the day and I don't think that he was a nobody because I do know that he was his songs were picked up immediately like I say there was a freedom fighter from Mother named Mayanti Bada the whom I had the good fortune of, of interviewing in the uh, late 80s. 
Um, and he remembers as a child singing Yendra Taniyum in the Sudandra Tatham, mid to later 20s. So just a few years after Bhadavi is dead. Um, yeah. So we go a little bit. Of yeah, please. Is there time? Yeah, yeah you're okay. sure. Just so that it just add them to that too, is he's also printing. He's printing. I mean, the bane of his existence, right? That drives him to early death and pain as he sees it. Right, that famous line, whatever you do, don't become a writer. Um, yeah. Which leads to my question. Yeah. At the time that Bharati is rising and Bhavati is rising, you have a bunch of the kind of old guard, Kalyanasundrono, yeah. Uesa, um, writing about their own experiences of the world. And I'm curious how Bharati sees these people, right? He met Uesa and had some clear experiences of, of Uesa's writings and work. Does he see a break from the past, or is he seeing continuities with what these people are trying to do also? So I, I And then the second part of that question is, who, who claims Bharati now in, among the political parties as things devolve to caste? It's a really good question. Both of them are really great questions I can't answer. That's fair enough. You know, um, I will say about Tirvika, however, he was a little kid during Swatish. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. writes about it. Right, that's the thing, he remembers everything. He remembers Pippin Chandra Paul's meetings he re as a little kid. So he doesn't really come into sort of political maturity until about 1915, 16. Right, right. Um, you know, then it's not a political maturity, but as a junior, and actually very active and very charismatic and forceful player in the labor movement and the Madras Presidency Association, and in the story that I'm hoping to tell in this book. But yeah, great questions. I'm, I'm going to try to figure it out. That's a good yeah, question. Yeah. So, there's one more guy back there. Well, that's what I just to can ask a, the, um, so it's about the reference. I suppose it's, it's, it's I'm thinking of these two moments in the talk, one of which is the beautiful figure of the poetics of mass number and your provocations to us. And it's, it's uh, for a lot of reasons, but so I'm trying to think, of, I mean, in part it was, the, I was trying to think, does it make sense for me to think about, because it's India in many ways, some of this society here is, but it could well be many, this question then later, over, to what extent might this be the India, for example, claimed also by contemporary Indutva, when and how might this be Tamil Nadu, you know, when it's, it's, it's um, but can these questions be asked? And so A, I'm trying to start with the question of, what is the, the reference of mass number? And um, I'm not sure I, I understand what you mean. Well, because it's 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 um, so if it's it's if the question of this new poetics of, of society, you know, is works through you know the figure of mass number through a bounded seriality or something else. It's 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 it's, it's um, the then to what extent are we can we ask a question about India versus Tamil Nadu? I mean at some point later he's in exile, Morgan replaces Krishna, yeah. um, he turns to you know a certain kind of bhajan, there's a way in which it descends into history and to, to something it's a different kind of poetics. But initially there's something interesting because you end with the uncanny again and again. And again you end with a form which is resisting a certain kind of referent. It's 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 uh, he's ghostly, he appears everywhere, he um, the, um, so I'm trying to think about how to put those two moments together, the moment of the question of mass number that you open with and the question mm -hmm. of the uncanny with which you close. In between, you have this right. figure that um, is, because we heard some of us heard David Schulman earlier today talking mm -hmm. about the iconic. The, when you talk about um, 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 the uh, sighting, uh, his sighting in that later Satyagraha you know, uh, rally uh, as producing the true unity of the song and the image of the portrait. That reminded me of Shulman's question of iconicity. I mean, the sense yeah. that it's it's yeah. it's uh, so once again, you know, there's this figure of true unity where something very interesting is happening to something like a, a semiotic relation. So there's these three moments: the number, the uncanny ghost, and then this this figure. I, so I'm just this is not yet a question, but they all seem you're well, pushing towards something. And uh, well, yeah. I think what I'm trying to talk about with uncanny is not just it's not just the uncanniness of the Indian stuff, but it's the uncanniness of the. Of, uh, here, let's put it this way: all, and I've been just struggling away with trying to talk about modernity, linguistic modernity, and political modernity. That's those are the two main frameworks by which I'm trying to figure out what's happening here. 
And the modernity that we see occurring here is uncanny. It's uncanny in its familiarity and its strangeness. And, and it, it is, um, and it leads me to the, to the idea that all, all modernities are vernacular modernities. There, are, there is no modernity and then vernacular modernity. All modernities are vernacular modernities in one way or another. And they're, and they're tracked um, in large ways by communicative and transportation, but communicative uh, modes of one sort or another. So what I'm trying to get at here in this notion of the uncanny is to try to see you know, how strange it is to have the, these, these mixtures of different kinds of universalisms, right? The universalism of Krishna of the Bhagavad Gita, for instance, which is a universalism, um, versus the universalism of of the Enlightenment, which we seem to be seeing here as well. I I I think this is why, and what you're trying to put together, the mass number, the uncanny ghost, and the the, the budgeon dancing, you know, and what was the third one? Well, it's the moment of iconicity. The moment of iconicity. Yeah, yeah it is. Where Everything collapses into a singularity of the sign that's that's uh, you know. But, but it's, uh, that's that's a one. Yeah. Let me just go. Yeah. 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 No, uh, yeah. I what I'm. I guess the point of the paper has been to try to m put together the uncanny ghost and the the poesy of, of and the, the sort of the multiple genealogies of Bhagavad's poetics um, uh, into this sort of strange. Uh, uncanny image of modernity. The, I think the provocation on iconicity is a good one, and I, and I want to think about it more. I, I will, like, like Blake's question, think about it more. Because um, it is, you can take any of these things as being, I mean, I think that the, the, the public meeting itself is a little icon, is a little, is a little emblem, a little ritual diagram of the larger universe that they're imagining. That's one of the basic ideas of this whole of this whole thing. So the public meeting itself, the formation of the public meeting as a mass, as a ritual of mass politics, is itself a little. This is the linguistic anthropologist in me. Is a little ritual diagram of the social order that they're imagining, with a, a, a central figure interpolating a mass, which then becomes the vernacular politician in Dravidianism, for instance, or in the Congress Party, or in Congress on the CPM or what. So what I'm going to suggest is because. I don't lose my audience. We have a small reception for you just outside. That we repair outside. We give Dr. Bill Moria the chance to ask the first question uh, by sure. wine and cheese, and uh, we continue there. No so we can have a bit of. Uh, but I'd like to honor that question. So please join me in thanking uh, Barney. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.